Welcome to FSC 211 and in this module we're going to talk about probability and we're going to cover the rules of probability, take you back to some of your school day maths and where we looked at probability. We're going to talk about event types and why event types are important and we're going to look at how do we do or where do we use probability multiplication and where do we use probability addition. So the first thing is Probability assignment. And probability can be assigned in two ways. It can be assigned due to the physical properties, the geom geometric shape, for example, a dice or a die has six sides. There's geometric shape for that. Or you can do it through experimental outcome. Many of you, I'm sure, remember at school tossing the coin, recording the outcome. Was it a head? Was it a tail? and doing that for a certain period of time to see roughly what did we get. So physical geometry, experimental outcome, those are the two methods. And in both cases, our probability is a number between zero and one. And we say that it's impossible to get a probability of more than 100%. So, and when we look at it from a reliability engineering point of view, we're always talking about the smallest unit of time being one hour. So we use an hour as the smallest period of time. Venn diagrams. Venn diagrams are useful because they give you a visual representation of probability. Venn was a, a mathematician. He came up with this concept where the event space, the entire event space is represented by a rectangle and the areas are allocated according to the probability of the event. So for example, if, if we were looking at a coin toss and we assumed a 50-50, this would be split in two saying heads and tails. So Venn was useful. The only thing about Venn, which is not, is what assumptions? What are the assumptions to get to this point? We do not know what the assumptions are. We're given a visual representation. We don't know how we got there. So for example, using a Venn diagram, we're given this situation where we're told probability of gold is 0.8, probability of marble is 0.75. And we can see we can calculate that because we have basically a five by four matrix. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. So we have 20 possible combinations. And then if we look at the probability of gold, we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So we would have 16 out of 20 possibilities for a gold. So 16 over 20, of course, is 0.8. Now, if we look at marble, we have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. So now we have 15 out of 20 possibilities for marble. And 15 over 20, of course, is 0.75. What we don't know is, how did we come up with this? What was the assumptions behind this? But from a visual representation point of view, it's very easy to see how we get the probability of gold and how we get the probability of a marble. And if we want to figure out the probability of getting a gold marble, we could take 0.8 times 0.75, or we could say it's 1, 2, 3, 4, times 1, 2, 3, so it's 12 over 20. And of course, 12 over 20 is going to be 6 over 10, or 3 over 5. So when it comes to event types, we talk about three different types. We talk about independent. These are events that do not affect each other. So for example, when you toss a coin, the outcome of the first toss is not going to affect the outcome of the second toss. And you can do two in parallel. They can either be series or parallel. The same with a dice. You throw the dice, the outcome of the first throw is not going to affect the outcome of the second, provided, of course, it's not a loaded dice. And you could take two of them and the same thing. You could do it in parallel. Complementary events are when one outcome does not occur, the other will always occur. So we know if we have 
a head, we're never going to get a tail. We know that if something works, it hasn't failed. So we could figure out if something works by subtracting it from one, we could figure out the probability of failure. Mutually exclusive, when one event occurs, the other cannot happen. Same with the coin. If we get a head, we know we, have, we can never get a tail. If we roll a dice and we get a one, we know we're not going to get a two or three or four or five or a six. These are mutually exclusive. And some complementary events can be mutually exclusive. When we show it on Venn, we talk about the probability of A and the probability of B. But you'll notice that we've got a section that overlaps. Because with mutually exclusive, we know we can't possibly get another outcome. But with independent events, there is the possibility of two occurring at the same time. When we talk about failures in general, we talk about failures being independent of each other. However, there is the possibility that if a failure occurs, a downstream component or a device may experience higher than usual stresses, which may also cause that one to fail. So with independent, there's always the possibility of some slight overlap, which is shown in the Venn. Now, let's look at an example. So we know if we have a limit switch and a solenoid valve, in order for this system to work, the limit switch and the solenoid valve needs to work. And you can hear that that's the logical operator, the AND. So if the probability of success for the limit switch is probability of A and the probability of success for the solenoid is B, we know that the probability of A and B is going to be the probability of A times the probability of B. So the success of this circuit. If we were looking at failures, on the other hand, we would know that either the limit switch or the solenoid valve could fail. So you hear automatically we're talking now or, so we would be looking at ending independent events. But let's just consider this for a minute. Let's assume one year is 8,760 hours, and the probability of successful operation for a limit switch is 0.9, in the first year, and the probability of the solenoid valve is 0.98. So what is the probability of success for the system consisting of these two elements? So using our independence, we would say that it's the probability of A times the probability of B, which comes out to be 0.882. And you can see here, we're showing in the Venn, here's the probability of the limit switch success, there's the probability of the solenoid success, there's the probability of the system, but up here is the piece that is not successful. So using our complement rule, we can say that if the probability of success of the system is 0.882, the probability of failure, therefore, will be 1 minus 0.882. When it comes to mutually exclusive events, we know that if one occurs, the other cannot possibly happen. So if it's a coin toss, we know if we get a head, we cannot get a tail. So these are completely separate. There's no possibility of an overlap in the middle. So we talk about the probability of A or the probability of B. So if we consider one die is rolled, what is the probability of getting a four or a six? Now we know we have six possible combinations. So therefore, possibility of getting a 4 or getting a 6 is going to be 1 in 6 for a 4, 1 in 6 for a 6. So the probability of A or B is going to be 1 in 6 plus 1 in 6, which is 2, 6 or 1 third. So it's fairly simple when we talk about the mutually exclusive. It becomes more complicated when we talk about independent events. Because now we consider the probability of A or B, but we have the overlap region which we have to eliminate. Otherwise we'd end up counting it twice. So let's look at an example using our independent. If we go back to our marbles and gold objects, we know a sack contains a hundred objects. All of the either round marbles or square blocks, all are either red or gold, 
From before, 75% of the objects are marble and 80% of the objects are gold. If an object is randomly selected, what is the probability that it will be either a marble or gold? Well, we know then that the marble or gold is not mutually exclusive because we can get a gold marble. So, we have to consider the independence. So therefore, using our probability of A or probability of B minus the probability of A and B, we can say that we have 0.8 plus 0.75 minus 0.75 times 0.8, which gives us 0.95. So, if we didn't consider the independence and we just took the, and assume mutually exclusive, we could see we would get the wrong answer because we'd have an answer more than one and we cannot get more than 100%. Another way of being able to look at this is to look at using the complement rule. So the complement rule would say, okay, the only way of getting, of not getting a gold object or a gold marble is to get a red block we can look at the probability of getting gold is 0.8. So if we subtract 0.8 from 1 using complement, we get 0.2. And the probability of getting a marble is 0.75. So if we subtract 0.75 from 1, we get 0.25. So if we multiply those together, we get 0.05. But we then have to remember to subtract from 1. And if we subtract 0.05 from 1, we get 0.95. We get the same answer using the complement rule. The beauty of the complement rule in this case makes the math a lot simpler, simply because we're just multiplying and then subtracting from 1. When it comes to three events, things become far more complicated because we have multiple areas that overlap and we have to consider initially the probabilities of A or B or C occurring, but then we have to eliminate the overlaps. But in doing so, ultimately, we would have another area where we'd have to add back in the A and B and C, otherwise we would not get the right answer. So in this case we can see if we just took A and B, we would have far too much area in green. So we would have to then consider the rest of it. Probability of C. Now if we take A and B and we add in C, take out A and B, now we have to take out the probability of A and C, the probability of B and C, and then add back in the probability of A and B and C. So here you can see, here's the A and C, here's the A, B and C, here's the B and C. So we have our A and C, B and C, and add back in the A, B and C. Same thing here. Here's our B and C only, and we have our A, B and C added back in. And ultimately, we end up with this overall formula to represent the independence of three events. So this makes the math slightly more complicated. Another way of looking at this, using our complement rule, is to say then, if we want to look at the probability of A or B or C or any event, number of events N, we could say it would be equal to 1 minus 1 minus the probability of A times 1 minus the probability of C times 1 minus the probability and so forth up to N. So we've simplified the math, but we have to remember to subtract it from 1. Otherwise we will not get the correct answer. So for multiple independent events, this is the easiest way to try and solve it using probability math. So let's look at it this way. You load one bullet into a chamber in a six-shot revolver. Once a year, you spin the chamber and fire into your chemical storage tank. If the gun fires, the tank will explode, causing an incident, which will be equipment damage and environmental problem. What is the probability of an incident in the first year? And then what is the probability of an incident over an interval of three years? And what is the probability of an incident in 10 years? So I'll give you five minutes to think about that and try and answer the question. And then we will return and go back through the answers. 
All right, let's revisit this question. We load one bullet into a chamber in a six-shot revolver. Once a year, spin the chamber, fire into the tank. If the, if the gun fires, the tank explodes and we have an incident. What's the probability in the first year? Well, this, of course, is a variation on Russian roulette. And if we have six possibilities and we have one bullet, the probability of the first year, of course, is going to be one in six. But what's the probability of an incident over an interval of three years? And some people say, well, it's okay, one in six times one in six times one in six. No, that's not the correct way to look at this. Again, thinking differently using our complement rule, we could say, okay, so if the probability of an incident in the first year is one in six, the probability of not having an incident in the first year, of course, is going to be one minus one in six, which is five six. So we could answer this question by saying it's going to be one minus, one minus the probability of not having an incident in the first year and not having an incident in the second year and not having an incident in the third year. So we could say it's going to be one minus five six times five six times five six, which of course is going to give us a different answer from one in six times one in six times one in six. And we'll look at the answers in a minute. So what's the probability of an incident in 10 years? Well, using the same approach, it would be one minus five six to the power of 10. So, as I said, the first year is going to be one in six. The second year, or the second question for three years would be the five six approach. But we must remember to subtract it from one. So what we're saying is, and if you think about it logically, the probability of, of an incident is going to be much higher the longer you go on. And in this case, we're saying we have a 42% or a 0.42 probability of an incident within three years. If we look at 10 years now, if we take our one minus five, six to the power of 10, we're now up at an 84% probability. So the longer the time period, the more likely we are to have an incident. And this applies in, in when we look at or when we consider safety instrumented systems and we look at probabilities of failure. The longer the time period, the more likely we are to get a failure. So that's the way to think about it, is, is to think slightly differently. Instead of thinking positively, you can look at it differently in terms of, okay, we're not getting an incident, so we can use our complement rule and we can reach the same answer as long as we remember this one minus. If you just did 0.579, of course, you're not going to get the right answer. You're going to be wrong. So complement rule is very useful to simplify the math. That covers the probability section and we know that rules of probability are assigned based on two methods, either due to ge geometric shape, physical shape, or through trial and error, or trial and recording. Event types, we know that we have independent events, we have complementary events, and we have mutually exclusive events. And when we consider failures, we normally consider failures to be independent events, and therefore, the use of probability multiplication and probability addition is very important. When we start considering fault trees later on, we use uh, multiplication for AND gates and, and addition through OR gates. And that's where that comes into play.